Hello and welcome back to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath Holland. I'm joined by writer, director, uh, jack of all trades, Max Allen Collins. Max, welcome back. Always great to be here, Heath. Uh, you know, one of my favorite people. Oh, you're one of my favorite people too. And you know so much about what we're going to talk about, which is the Western. We're going to list our, we should be careful how we say this. These are going to be our, we're saying the top five. It doesn't mean these are the best ever made. It's kind of favorites. just the five we want to. Favorites, right? I it's mean, it's I, the five I want to talk about today. And, and you know, you've got another five and I've got another five. And so, so I, we don't, we don't need to get into where's high noon. You know, okay. Well, I like high noon, but a lot of people have already talked about high noon. And I think we're going to talk about a few that haven't gotten much attention. That's kind of the point is uh, talking about some movies that maybe haven't been talked about ad nauseum. I want to start with a 1957 movie called Quantes. It's directed by Harry Keller, who was really a workaday director who worked at Republic. And he just cranked this stuff out. But Quantes is from the 1950s. In fact, every movie on my list is from the 1950s. Go figure. Surprise, surprise. Um, it's a Fred McMurray movie that I think was probably a huge influence on Quentin Tarantino and Reservoir Dogs because when we join our band of outlaws, they are riding south to Mexico after having done a robbery that we never see. And they stop to rest the horses and, you know, refuel at a town called Quantes, close to Mexico. And when they arrive, Quantes is abandoned. So what's going on in Quantes? And then the group starts to eat themselves. They start to just turn on each other. Fred McMurray goes from, he's, so he's the, the outlaw that has like a quiet dignity and that thing that he projects, right? This sort of weariness, this brooding menace. And he's got, he's got more going on than we know. He reveals a secret um, that, uh, that we discover as the movie goes on. And it's an economical movie that was shot primarily in just a few locations. It's short. It's I think it's 80 something minutes long, which is, uh, that's another theme on my list is not not overstaying your welcome with these movies. And it's uh, an example of a movie that just wastes nothing. Everything that's on the screen needs to be there to tell the story. And I think that it's a great hidden gem. But over the years, I've been talking about this movie for years now. It's become one of my favorite Westerns because there's nothing else that I, it, it just, it's not, you, you don't look at it and go, oh, look at this great ostentatious performance, this Oscar winning performance. It's just quietly good. And uh, I like to champion that. So Quantes, it's on Blu-ray from Kino Lorber, by the way. One of the things that we see in these Westerns is sometimes they have great epic sweep and you, you, have, you have the Magnificent Seven and that even though a lot of it ha takes place in that little Mexican village, mm -hmm. it has a sense of epic sweep. A lot of people, a lot of guns, a lot of, lot of, lot of mountains surrounding, you know, the, the, the setting. But you also have these kind of chamber piece westerns where, where you go, you know, you, the outlaws go to this little abandoned town. Mm -hmm. And all of the uh, Bud Boddicker westerns basically are chamber piece westerns. They... And some of that was obviously dictated by the fact that there were B-movies and they didn't have a huge budget. Um, Boddicker liked to, as we will discuss, he, he liked to have like a big scene at maybe at the beginning and then it gets small and stays kind of small. Mm -hmm. Yes. Shall we move into to one of mine? Please do. Gunfight at the OK Corral, I find very interesting. First of all, I, I'm, I've read a lot about Wyatt Earp and I've written about Wyatt Earp. I did a book called Black Hats that was about Wyatt Earp in his later years. It, it's a book in which uh, I do a little plug here for myself, but Black Hats is about um, old Wyatt Earp uh, meeting young Al Capone, which I think is uh, kind of, that's the kind of high concept thing that, that gets me going sometimes. But, but I remember seeing a gunfight at the OK Corral uh, at a drive-in when I was pretty young. I think the movie is... 15 is it 59 uh but at any rate it, it's late 50s and i saw i would have been 11 12 years old and so my got my parents to take me to the drive-in and the wyatt earp tv show with you o'brien the life and legend of wyatt earp had just debuted a while back 
and was very big. It, it, it with Gunsmoke was what invigorated Westerns on TV and started the fad for Westerns on, on TV. And I was so startled as a kid at how adult some of the themes were in Gunfight at the OK Corral, the, the sexuality, the drinking, and, and uh, the, uh, the male bonding that with, with almost a homoerotic undertone to it sometimes. Uh, and I didn't what I didn't know what I was seeing. What is this about? It wasn't you, O'Brien. It wasn't it wasn't that version of of Wyatt Earp. And I think that planted a seed with me and always being interested in, okay, this guy really lived. This is a movie about a bunch of people that really lived. Now we know that it wasn't an incredibly accurate uh, rendition of the OK Corral. There have been few of those. Uh, but it was John Sturgis again, that mm -hmm. director, uh, and it had. It's an interesting transitional movie because all of those adult themes that I'm referring am referring to, still, it was the '50s, so you had that wonderful, wonderful corny, but what I think wonderful, uh, Frankie Lane theme song. That just tells you exactly what's happening yeah, in the movie. Yeah, now they're riding down the street, and you know, it's, just, it's, yeah. just, it, it's so terrible and wonderful. And it comes out of High Noon, obviously, because High, High Noon with the Tex Ritter song, uh, Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was a moment in, in 50s Westerns. So you have this sort of old-fashioned old and kind of corny thing going on as it's moving into what's going to be a very different era, the, the 1960s and, and adult Westerns, because that's a phrase you don't hear much anymore. But that was what... The TV, the TV shows of that era, they were referred to as adult westerns. That didn't mean that people were taking their clothes off. It, it, it meant the, the people in the, in the dramas were acting like actual human beings and had the kind of conflicts that human beings have, as opposed to Roy Rogers and Gene Autry and, and that kind of fun. And the Lone stuff. Ranger. The Lone Ranger. But um, the OK Corral movie it, uh, is... A little more accurate than it's given credit for it like as often happens with historical fiction things are moved around and telescoped and so on uh, one of the fun things i think for for me as a star trek fan is seeing deforest kelly turn up mm -hmm. as as one of the earth brothers and then later he would there would be a star trek episode based around the okay corral and that's and right so, but you have the you know the you don't have the 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 so-called vendetta ride that, that has been handled in a lot of the Wyatt Earp movies, but you do an hour of the gun. Now, what's amazing, and we're, we're going to be talking about this, how much happened in a short period of time. So you have this happening in 1957, Gunfight the OK Corral. Then you have the same director, 1967, a uh, very different movie. Mm -hmm. Now we have that they're, do, they're making an attempt to tell the story it, pretty much accurately, maybe not as accurately as they claimed, but it's fairly accurate. You have Garner playing a very un Brett Maverick kind of uh, gunfighter. He looks like Brett Maverick, but he, he totally humorless, mm -hmm. rarely smiles in that movie. Jason Robards, who basically is, is rather than the way Kirk Douglas played him uh, as this hair trigger, uh, you know, alcoholic, Jason Robards is, is basically Jiminy Cricket in that movie. He's basically he's basically Wyatt Earp's conscience. And and then you have a great Ike Clanton in uh, in Robert Ryan. And it's very much moving into an area that has more to do with, say, the Wild Bunch and Italian Westerns than it does with those movies from the 50s. Mm -hmm. So if you put those two movies by the same talented director side by side, they could almost not be more different not be more different even though it's the same subject matter and the second one is essentially a sequel to the first now one last little little detail that i love is that sturgis wanted to use a, a few of the actors from the original movie in the second movie and one of the ones he wanted to use was deforest kelly to bring him back as wyatt Earp's, one of Wyatt's brothers but you know why deforest kelly wasn't available 
He was busy making Star Trek. He was on the Enterprise. He was on the Enterprise. But isn't it interesting how, I mean, 10 years is nothing. That's an eye blink. Yeah. But in popular culture, it can be, it, you know, it, 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 it can be a, a decade suddenly in, a, in an eye blink. Yeah. Yeah. Everything changes really quickly. Very and, quick. And we don't go back. We usually don't go back. Well, and, and they were making Italian Westerns at that point. I mean, uh, Fistful of Dollars is what, like a 1964 movie? Yeah. So yeah. these things, I mean, the idea that you had, you had Clint Eastwood going over and, and doing movies with, with Leone as the man with no name, and then going back and doing a season of Rawhide. Uh-huh. And then, and which he did a couple times. Mm -hmm. The idea that he was playing, you know, Rowdy Yates and the, uh, you know, the man with no name, basically at the same time in his career, is to me mind boggling. It's it they is. couldn't be more culture pop culturally different. They're two completely different worlds. Absolutely. Well, so I should I move into my? Uh, I'm going to piggyback off of your Sturgis and do a Sturgis myself. So two years after. Uh, okay, Corral, we get Last Train from Gun Hill, which I watched for the first time when it came out on Blu-ray, I think, from Par the Paramount Presents line, I think is what it was. And uh, it absolutely blew me away. So it's uh, 1959, like I said, it's directed by John Sturgis, and it's <sighs> Kurt Douglas is um, friends with Anthony Quinn, and his what Kurt Douglas's wife is riding home with their son one day. They get attacked. And his wife, I mean, this is a word. So his, his wife is, is sexually assaulted. She's killed. Basically, he learns it's his friend Anthony Quinn's son that did this. And so now we've got these two old friends who are on opposite sides of the law. And Kirk Douglas wants revenge. He's you know, like, give me your son. Your son did this. He's got to pay. And Anthony Quinn is like, I love you, but this is my son. What are you doing? So his son flees. Kirk Douglas goes after him. And... It's this incredible, incredible uh, layered story about the sins of the father, the sins of the, like, what is the father's responsibility to his son? What is the son's responsibility to the father? It, what is friendship? You know, friendship versus family. There's so much here and it feels very informed by real life. It's not, it's not an, a, a um, it's a very, nuance story that feels true to life and and it's not dealing with these like large tropes and you know uh it's dealing with personal i think all the stuff i didn't realize this until we started talking about it but i think everything on my list is small and personal character based when people which happens often people say i don't know about westerns they're just so silly i think about movies like last train from gun hill and i'm like how many have you watched well, again, it, this this is because for many many years, I uh, decades, uh, it was westerns were kid stuff. Generally speaking, there were exceptions. There was the stagecoach kind of movie and so on, but it was what you went on Saturday matinee, you right. know, to see the cowboys and Indians or whatever. And when you get into that era of t a TV, Gunsmoke was was a very adult show. It was as adult as as Dragnet was in yes. crime novels. They they in crime movie TV. They really had changed, and so you don't. I kind of that phrase is kind of forgotten now. But at the time, adult western was a was what the way these TV shows and movies mm -hmm. uh, were you know were discussed, and so that was really uh, happening a lot in the westerns, mm -hmm. a lot in the westerns, and. Well, let's see, I, I, I said my turn. Yeah, please. Okay, well, I, I'm going to do the first. I'm going to lead you into to Bud Boddicker and uh, great. And, and take Randall me there. Scott. I was tempted to do Ride Lonesome. That's the one they talk about the most because it has that dramatic, uh, you know, that dramatic tree that burns at the end of the of the picture. It's got Lee Van Cleef in it. Who doesn't like a you know a western with Lee Van Lee Van Cleef in it? But the very last one that, that uh, Bud Boddicker directed from uh, from a Burt Kennedy script was Comanche Station. 
and I and it's a beautiful widescreen movie. Uh, I think it is the most tragic of those movies, the one because he because the Randolph Scott character is trading, you know, horses and and and, and guns and whatever he has to, because he's heard. He goes around when he hears that the that an Indian tribe is holding a white woman, he will go trade for her. He's looking for his wife. He's looking for his wife. She's probably long dead. But he's trying to find her. And that's how the movie begins. And that's how it ends. He's still looking for, you know, it it this 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 tragic uh perpetual journey that he's on give, gives it a a feel that even the other movies as great as they are doesn't have that inevitability of tragedy uh and the the man on this this journey that's never going to end so mm -hmm. he ends uh and that was going to be randolph scott's last movie he retired but they brought him back for ride the high country which isn't on our list but boy it should be it, well yeah I mean, it's, if we were doing the best five westerns, I can tell you, I would have that that movie on that that that's actually my favorite Peck and Paul movie too. Well, see, that was one of those movies that is informed by everything he did before it. Absolutely. It's the it's the, the end cap. It's, it's the, the Unforgiven. It's it's Clint Eastwood doing Unforgiven. Yeah. It's the commentary on it, the entire career. So to do Ride the High Country, you have to see all the Randolph Scott westerns that came. We don't have to, but. It is the final notes in a long career doing that thing. It is it is the 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 final goodbye. And, and then the other thing about Comanche Station is he is he's playing with those. Burt Kennedy is as much on our tour here as 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 uh, as as Bob Bedecker because he he basically takes the same story elements, uh, which is is generally the the villain the villain who is is kind of genial and likable mm -hmm. probably more so more so than randall scott who's a you know pretty stoic individual and and he's all usually traveling with two two younger guys and who are his 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 his, his dopey uh you know gunsels mm -hmm. and you've got you, you know you he moves but bedeker and and kennedy move these chess pieces around to have different things going on so that in ride lonesome basically at the end of ride lonesome uh, spoiler alert uh randolph there there isn't the in what seems to be the in inevitable showdown with with the with the likable villain now you know in comanche station we do have a showdown as i recall but uh and these these are what 80 minute movies yes I saw these as a kid at, 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 with no idea what I was seeing, that I was seeing something, uh, you know, oh, my, yeah, we're going to a Western this afternoon, Mom. And But, boy, these things had a resonance that I think really, uh, really hit me hard as a kid. Well, that's why on the Blu-rays and, and various releases over the years, like Martin Scorsese is championing these movies, and he's oh, talking yeah. about seeing them as a kid and – being blown away by the they're so perfectly crafted now i want to talk about one too so i'll just jump right in here because we can it's it's the same conversation so i got the tall t on my list but really it could have been any of them yeah it, it, the tall t is uh it's richard boone it's henry silva um it's skip holmeyer and it's what you just said it's the older the older bad guy and then the two younger bad guys who were kind of um in this movie, Henry Silva and the tall T Henry Silva is sort of a psychopath. He just wants he to really kill people. Is. And Skip Holmeyer is the guy who's young and inexperienced, and he wants to prove himself. He wants to get his hands dirty. But Richard Boone is the worst of all because he's older. He knows better. He knows right from wrong, and he's choosing wrong. And because he and Randolph Scott are both older in the movie, there's this. It's Die Hard. That's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it is because the tall T is essentially Die Hard, but 30 years earlier because it's a hostage situation. Uh, Richard Boone and his his gang have basically, they're holding this couple for ransom for money. They want to get money out of the deal. 
And what they didn't count on was Randolph Scott. And there's also a really interesting por- performance from Maureen O'Sullivan, who is... Yeah. We should talk about this, too, is like the, the role of women in some of these movies, because they don't always have something to do. Sometimes they're just window dressing or the MacGuffin that has to go be saved. But in, in Maureen O'Sullivan in The Tall T is... Now, we're talking about Jane from... Right. She's Jane Tarzan. to Tarzan to Weissmuller's Tarzan. A beautiful woman. But the movie doesn't present her as beautiful. It presents her as over the hill and kind of plain. Not necessarily ugly, but not attractive either. She doesn't she's an believe old maid. She's, she's essentially an old maid. Exactly. Exactly. There's so much in this movie. Again, it's like 80 minutes, 81 minutes long, but it's this meal of character and of of uh of the the development the where they where the characters start and where they end up full character arcs not a line of dialogue is wasted again everything that's there is there to want either inform us there's a line that takes place at like why is the movie called the tall t well there's like one scene that takes place at this ranch where they say to randolph scott well you used to, basically like you used to be somebody you used to have a lot of gumption not anymore so they they've established that he's oh. not viewed well by his community and we get to see who he actually is, who he really is after that. Like everything, everything fits. Everything has a place. Well, and um, something that's interesting in that movie to me is that uh, I love it when you've got actors from from different sort of eras and schools. Mm-hmm. So that, like I mentioned, uh, like I mentioned, Anatomy of a Murder. It's it's incredible to see James Stewart operating with george c scott you know yes because they're from such different acting worlds Mm -hmm. and and there's some sense of uh this is how it's done no this is how it's done you know and i i I love i love that you know that that push Mm -hmm. pull there and i feel that's what you've got randolph scott is a movie old-time movie star very understated and then you've got Richard Boone, who's more method mm-hmm. and modern and willing to chew a little scenery. And so the contrast between the two, who are essentially yeah. the same guy, yeah. if you get right down to it. They are. But played by different by actors from different eras. That's the delight of, the, of that movie. Mm-hmm. And, and I think one of the things that, that is wonderful about uh, Ride Lonesome is it's the first time in one of these movies where Randolph Scott doesn't have to kill the the other guy, you know, he just like, oh, you, yeah, you take her, take, 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 take this guy. I don't, I am not interested. In, mm-hmm. I've had my revenge and, and so I'm not interested anymore. You can have the bounty. Who cares? Yeah. And, but uh, again, it's the way they move these chess pieces around in these Bud Boddicker, uh Burt Kennedy movies is fascinating because it's the same it's really the same story arranged in a different, you know, d- yep. slightly different pattern. Uh, it's not for- formulaic, and that's not what I'm, you know, that's not. What no, I'm- and they feel different. It's the same pieces, but they all feel very different. They form a slightly different puzzle, and and I think one one of the things that 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 I had a, I had a teacher tell me this once about about uh, genre fiction. And, and that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a genre fiction guy. It made a point to me that these stories tend to be about either the, the beginning of somebody's story, the middle of somebody's story, or the end of somebody's story. And these Randolph Scott movies are all about the end of Randolph Scott's story. And li- literally, uh, Ride the High Country is very much that mm-hmm. of him and Joel McRae. You know, see you later, that line, which doesn't seem like a profound line, but always, I always get teared up. Yeah. See you later. Okay. Uh, and, and so, Adios. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think, and that's, that's why when, when Clint, Clint Eastwood made The Unforgiven, you just knew he would never make another another formal Western. Mm-hmm. He, he, he'd put the period on the end of the sentence. Yeah. And people know? want him to. They go, why don't you do another one? Why, why would he? What is there left to say that he didn't say yeah. already? That's right. That's, That's right. something we don't understand in our current society is that there's an end to everything. And when you go past that natural end, you're going to get diminished returns. 
Yeah, and, and I've dealt with that in my fiction, <laughs> where, where you know, they want another one, and you know, and I try to make sure that it's if I give them another one that it's worth giving it to them. I mean, I've started writing about my cor- my character Corey, the hitman. I started writing about him where he's basically my age because he was my age when he started out. Uh, you know, many many years ago in in, in the seventies. Well, yeah. He's still he's still the same guy, and he, he you know he may not move quite as fast, but he moves. He moves. What if the road to perdition, the ending for the road to perdition, was just a dream, and they're still on the road? They wake up and they're still on the road. <laughs> Run with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm not that big a, a, a whore, but I I am one. I mean I mean you know I I I, sure. I, I do this, but I do love I do love my characters, and I tend to write ser- series fiction. Because I do, I do get, uh, you know, I have an affection for some of these characters. So whose turn is it now? It's your turn, because I, I threw in the tall T, so it's your turn. Okay, uh, I'll do one that I know that you'll, you'll chime in on, because I, I want to talk about a little bit about No Name, uh, no name for, on the Bullet, which is okay. uh, arguably Audie Murphy's uh, greatest Western. Uh, and, I'm saying uh, something. And, yeah, and he, you know, he made, he, you know, he he made some bad ones, he made some mediocre ones, he made a bunch of good ones, and he made a couple of great ones, and this one I I think arguably is is the best, and it is another one that is largely a town, you know, most of this happens in the town. They go out mm-hmm. to a ranch at the end, but it's mostly in in the town, and he comes to town and is known to be a basically a professional killer. Who has stayed out of jail because he always goads the, the you know his victim into drawing first so so it's self-defense and when he comes to town you have everybody who's settled in this little town there's any number of people who have dark histories you know maybe mm-hmm. they maybe the general store where it came out of money from a from from a stagecoach robbery right and so they all wonder is he in town to kill me mm-hmm and that that is a fascinating premise, I think, because you have all kinds of you have all kinds of people basically trying to kill him, trying to get the jump on him because they assume wrongly that that he's in town to get them, and he doesn't he never doesn't tell them. And he's and it's a incredibly, I would say, typical but almost prototypical uh, underplaying performance, but by, by Murphy. Who I think was a terrific actor, and uh, you and I have talked about the fact that in some of the movies, people around him overact because they're trying. They think they have to compensate for him because mm-hmm. they don't think he's doing anything. That's yeah. that you know that that's the the Lawrence Olivier story where where he thought Marilyn Monroe wasn't doing anything, so he had to work really hard in the Prince and the Showgirl. And then he got in and looked at the dailies and said, "She's mopping the floor with me." doing apparently nothing because these these actors knew the difference between movies and theater and 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 that and so anyway that's a terrific it's a terrific movie if you haven't seen uh anybody out there hasn't seen no name on the bullet that's that's the one to see uh and it's jack arnold who is the guy that did you know creature from the black lagoon and all, all that uh, a universal workhorse, right? Yeah. He was the favorite director on the Brady Bunch. The, the kids on the Brady Bunch <laughs> loved him more than anybody else because he was nice. And they said he would just sit under the camera and he'd be like, okay, do it do it this way. Or he'd be like, that's great, kids. They liked working with him. So just a good di- just a good guy. Just a good dude. Well, he, he sure knew what he was he sure knew what he, he was doing. Uh Charles Drake is in that and he was a friend of Murphy's. I think he's in uh I think he's in uh, the uh, uh, you know Murphy's autobiography. To Hell and Back is interesting because it is it's the story of Murphy's life in terms of, of World War uh, of him mm-hmm. becoming the most decorated right. um, soldier in the European uh, you know theater. But uh, that was for many many years, and I think I may have said this in the show before. Uh, that was Universal's biggest movie. And it, it had the biggest box office, and they kept re-releasing it. I saw it in theaters 
uh, when I was in like junior high and it, it was a movie from maybe 10 years before. And and they tried a couple of times to make him into a, a movie star who was not appearing in Westerns, mm -hmm. but always he'd, he drifted, he, they, they try a couple of times and then he'd end up back in Westerns. And I think he liked playing Westerns. I think he was very comfortable. I think of that story you told um, when we first, my first interview with you, you told the story about him getting pulled over by the cops. Tell that story again really well, quick. Well, he, 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 he was speeding through, I don't know, Beverly Hills or something, and a, and a cop saw somebody speeding and pulled him over, and, and, and it was Audie Murphy. And Murphy had, you know, like like a forty five or something on his on, on the seat next to him, mm -hmm. and the cop apparently just the traffic cop apparently just or the the hybrid patrolman type of cop said, "Oh, Mr. Murphy, just saw I saw it was you, and I'm just a big fan. I want to say, I'm going to get back in my car real quick. Yeah, I wanted to just want to say hello, and I hope I'm not bothering you, and uh, you know." Yeah, and then and then the other story that it's that is apparently true. I because I don't want him to be apocryphal anyway, and I think I told you this one too uh, mm -hmm. that uh, he was at a, he was at a football game and some you know some uh, Italian gangster basically tried to put the arm on him and and tried to say ah oh, you're not so hot you're just a little guy and he was a little guy and supposedly he said. Uh, I killed a hundred, you know, I killed a hundred of you guys in Sicily. One more isn't going to make any difference. And the guy booked. Yeah. So and he, he had, movie. that's the thing is he had actually done that. Yeah. You know, he, he is one of my heroes. I mean, and my character Corey that I mentioned is largely based on, uh, on Aud Audie Murphy, based on a friend of mine uh, who came back damaged uh, from Vietnam and Audie Murphy and I kind of combined them into this character and I've done like 19 books about him <laughs> so I love the Corey yeah. character too yeah yeah uh, we should also mention from No Name on the Bullet it's co-written by Gene L. Coon so there's yeah, another Star, Star Trek, Trek again yeah, yeah that's a recurring uh, I'm a Star Trek. recurring theme yeah uh, and he you know he was a uh, one of the best Star Trek writers well I want to talk about a neo-western uh, Ah. In the neo neo western meaning a western that doesn't take place in the old west it takes place in the more modern west so i'm gonna talk about bad day at black rock which is another sturgis movie it's my second and final sturgis movie on the list <laughs> and, and uh it's set in 1945 it's made in 1955 it's set 10 years earlier and it's another one of these small short economical movies that's based around characters so spencer tracy rides into this town on a train and gets off the train and he's looking for somebody and the town has a secret and they're covering it up. So I'm, I'm going through this pretty quickly because I don't it, to say anything about this would be to tie, to, to rob the viewer. Cause there's gonna be people who watch this have never probably never even heard of bad day at black. A wonderful Rock. movie. It's an incredible movie. Robert Ryan is wonderful in it. It's a, it's got one of those great casts too. It's got Anne Francis, Dean Jagger, Walter Brennan, Ernest Borgnine and, uh, and Lee, Lee Marvin, Marvin. Lee, Lee Marvin. Marvin. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah, and I think the, you've got you've got Spencer Tracy, not really your conventional action hero. No, who who's up against some really classic Hollywood tough guys, and mm -hmm. he's got one arm, but he lost the arm in in World War Two, mm -hmm. so he's a returning World War. I mean, so this is a guy that saw combat. Maybe these jokers didn't they just think they're they're just local yokel tough guys he's the real deal and that was one of the first movies that really brought karate and martial arts into it by way of that great renowned martial artist action star spencer tracy <laughs> yeah but, yeah it's one of those movies that you know to your point these <clears throat> movies that are made during the latter 40s or in the 50s, I guess into the 60s too, but they're really pulling from real combat experience. And, and yeah. if, if the combat doesn't end up on screen, <clears throat> we're not talking about war movies. We're talking about Westerns, but it's also in film noir. The stuff they came back with, the baggage that these guys came back with, all ended up in the art. It all ended up in the movies. And I think Bad Day at Black Rock is one of those, one of the, I think everything on my list probably qualifies for that because I've, gone exclusively the 50s are my favorite era for westerns for for good reason well so i mean i'm i'm 
I'm, I'm, I guess, I don't know if I would say well known, but I'm known for my connection with Mickey Spillane and, and Mike Hammer. Mm -hmm. And Mike Hammer was the traditional private eye that we had seen, Philip Marlowe, Sam Spain, who, but who had been in World War II. Yeah. And the first case is his best friend was murdered. His best friend who, interestingly, gave away an arm, like like Spencer Tracy is lacking an arm. That's, so they come back, these are people who came back damaged, yeah. right? And, and that's what's fascinating about Mike Hammer and why Mike Hammer took off. He's a little forgotten now, but boy, he, he, was, he was bigger than James Bond in his, in his day. And it, it, it was, he was it, to transform paperback publishing. Mm -hmm. And that was all those, his audience were, were uh, you know, GIs who came back from the war. Yeah, it was darker. It was grittier. Much it felt more pulled from life instead of, there's an innocence that is lost with World War II that you never see again. Well, and now we're so far removed from it. Those people are, are gone or they're they're leaving us and you don't see it again. But for a while there, it was in everything. It was this this darkness or this loss of innocence that you could tell the creator was grappling with or just working their stuff out. They, they saw things, they did things, they heard things, and it, it ends up in everything. You know, one of the things I think that's really interesting about Bad Day of Black Rock is how they they absolutely told told you it was it was a western even though it was mm -hmm. contemporary it right. sounds like a western that that is not an urban sounding story uh, right title and and i if you told you told most people uh there's a movie called bad day at black rock you ought to see they they say oh western yep even now even all these years later they that would be their first their first reaction and it absolutely is a Western because it's the only the only difference is the clothes and instead of horses we have cars, you know. And it's the town with the secret, the town mm -hmm. with a, a terrible terrible secret. Yeah. Now now my my next one is and I I should uh, let me harken back to No Name on the Bullet. One of the things that that movie seems to be about is um, blacklist paranoia. In, in you know that he, he, some so we've done something bad and there's and so so it, it could be looked at as a kind of allegory about about uh you know the about about the, the hollywood blacklist and the communist scare well that really was one of the things that informed high noon and that that was all always talked about and you had carl foreman who was the the director and I did he write it as well? I think so. Uh, he, you know, that is um, often looked at as a as a kind of a, le a leftist take on the western. But I'm fascinated by one of the things that fascinates me about my choice for the next slot, Rio Bravo, is that it, it was Howard Hawks and John Wayne. It was their answer to High Noon. Mm -hmm. They 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 did not like that Gary Cooper went around asking for help that he didn't get. They said we don't need help. We're you know, John Wayne doesn't need any help, he, and he, you actually have John Wayne as the sheriff in town, who people come to to help voluntarily. Doesn't ask him. Doesn't put him out to do that. And uh, it was a movie that was also Howard Hawks. Had been away from the western a while and he was one i mean he did all kinds of movies as we know but he had done some of the definitive westerns red you know red river for example i think he was in europe for a while working on some things and he came back and that whole adult western thing was happening on tv so the western had changed on him and even though he kind of ushered it in the adult western in himself with the relationship between Montgomery uh, Clift and John Wayne in, in Red River, um, he, he you know he saw what was going on, particularly on TV, and how the Western be became big again. And he basically did his version of it in this movie, but with John Wayne. He even brings Ward Bond in as the head of a wagon train. Ward Bond is wearing the same costume that he wore playing you know, playing the, the wagon master in, in on the TV show Wagon Train. The difference is that Ward Bond gets killed early on, 
and becomes part of what what John Wayne is doing to uh, his name is Chance, which I think is a great name for mm-hmm. for a hero. Uh, he you know he he basically uh, is is I guess avenging uh, his friends his friends murder, and you have kind of an Alamo situation set up where you have. Uh, you know John Wayne and then Rick Rick Nelson, which is just absolutely Howard Hawks saying, "Well, we better get a rock and roller in here for the kids." Yeah, I think and that was even maybe studio mandated. It might have been, and but although I can certainly see, because Howard Hawks was a guy who cared a lot more about scenes than he did about story. He he just wanted to do good scenes. If he has a weakness, it's it's that. Yeah, but the scenes are so wonderful, you kind of don't care. Mm-hmm. And so, so he he has these wonderful characters. He's got Walter Brennan, and who's who's basically playing the same character from from the real McCoy's TV show. He's got, and then he's got Dean Martin in Dean Martin's I think first really great non you know Martin and mm-hmm. Lewis performance. Right. He had done some things, The Young Lions, and so on, and and that really introduced Dean Martin to westerns. And Dean Martin became kind of a western star. I mean. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I just watched not a great Western, but a fun Western five card stud, mm-hmm. which is put out on a uh, 4k by, uh, I think vinegar syndrome, yep. vinegar syndrome. And, and he's, he's a, just, he, he's so comfortable. Dean Martin is so comfortable as a Western hero, yep. but here they play off Dean Martin's reputation as a drunk. He's a drunk at the beginning of the movie, and then he gets rehabilitated as as the movie goes along. And it's about male bonding and friendship. And there's a very kind of adult relationship between uh, Angie St- Angie Dickinson and John Wayne. Uh, again, it's a town story. It's kind of compact. A lot of it happens in this jail, and what a lot of it happens in the, in this hotel. Mm-hmm. Where 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 uh, you know where the Wayne character lives, it's a lot of snappy dialogue. Uh, Leigh Brackett is the primary author of the screenplay. Leigh Brackett is fascinating because she she is a, a a mystery writer and a science fiction writer who, uh, I believe it was it was it was Hawks it was Hawks again. Hawks had had read one of the books that she she had written, not knowing she was a she. And it was like, well, I want we're going to do Big Sleep based on Raymond Chandler. Let's get that. I like this book that this guy, Lay Brackett, wrote. Let's get him in here to write this. And then, of course, a woman shows up. Mm-hmm. And then he began to use her. And he, she did. I think she did Doctari as well for Howard Hawks. And so she she she's a screenwriter here. She wrote the novelization. Uh, so there's an a, out there somewhere is a lay bracket novelization of uh, Rio Bravo, and then eventually she wrote Empire Strikes Back. Turned in a draft and then died. Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> but she also wrote, which is fascinating. She wrote the Long Goodbye, which is the Elliot Gould sort of uh, deconstruction of yes. of the character from The Big Sleep, Philip Marlowe. But she was a terrific writer. And uh, and her, her fingerprints are all over th- that movie, uh, the the snappy dialogue, and uh, there's a lot of action. R- Ricky Nelson does a good job in the movie. He does. You 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 believe him, and it is it's a long movie that goes by that seems like it's about forty five minutes long. I mean, mm-hmm. it just it just flies. Yeah, and uh, remains one of my favorite my favorite westerns. I think and it's, it's wonderful. And it's it's a point where it, it's just, a, again, it's a transitional point for Wayne where he's now moving into I'm a, I'm, a, I'm overtly a middle-aged guy who's been around a while. Mm-hmm. And that, that confidence that he has, that ease he has. And again, a lot of people don't think that John Wayne's a good actor. I don't know what good screen acting is if if what he does in Rio Bravo isn't great screen acting, yeah. and then you might look at the Shootist, for example, his last. Oh one. yeah. Uh, I mean, well, that's another one that's informed by all the movies that came before it. Even has clips. 
yeah from from some of the other movies well, I'm going to go, I guess my last one is Vera Cruz from 1954, which is a movie that I do not hear many people talking about at all. It's directed by Robert Aldrich, who's the guy behind the Dirty Dozen. And, and Kiss Me Deadly. Kiss Me yeah, Deadly. Yes. yes. Kiss Me Deadly. Forgot who I was talking to. Um, <laughs> and it stars Gary Cooper and Burt Lancaster. And to be honest with you guys, to be honest with you, two guys that have risen in my esteem over the years. When I first started to discover older movies, I thought both of them were kind of dull. But as I've gotten older, I've really come to appreciate what they're doing. So in this movie, uh, Gary Cooper is coming back from the Civil War. He was on the losing side. He's a good man who was on the wrong side of the Civil War. And Burt Lan he runs into Burt Lancaster, who's just a piece of crap. He's just the meanest. It's, <laughs> it's the most black hat, unnuanced performance on my list and probably in Burt Lancaster's career, he just, he's Darth Vader in the West. I mean, he's dressed in black. He's just chewing scenery, being terrible, talking about all the people that he's killed. And uh, they end up together sort of escorting this Mexican countess to, to back to Mexico. And there's a fortune on the motorcade. It's not a motorcade, but on the, the, um, what would you even call it? It's, you know, like a their, their carriage line. They're going back to Mexico and there's a lot of money there. And they're supposed to be guarding her. But then this heist sort of scheme starts to develop. It's incredibly violent. It does a lot of the things that the Wild Bunch did mm -hmm. like 15 years later. This is, yeah. I mean, this is the 50s. This is early. This is 1954. So this isn't even later 50s. This is 54. I know there's, a, there's uh, bullets in there, like headshots. A guy gets a spear in the throat. Um, it is incredible. And it's shot outside of our usual, you know, the, the, so many movies shoot in Monument Valley or they shoot at Vasquez Rocks or something like that. This shot, a lot of uh, footage in Mexico. And there's actually a scene uh, near the end of the movie that takes place at uh, the pier Mexico's Pyramid of the Sun. And it just doesn't look like anything else. So I think it was an huge influence on Peckinpah. I know that there are some directors that have acknowledged it as being an influence. Clearly, this is an iconic movie that, again, just not enough people are talking about. So I imagine a lot of people are going to be watching this that may never have even heard of Vera Cruz. First of all, there's a review at serialatmidnight.com. I reviewed this, so go check out my review. Um, I put a quote from my review. It's, the, it's talking about Burt Lancaster. It's the kind of role one has to imagine every actor hopes they get to play at least once. An irredeemable man of violence that is somehow so well written that the audience roots for them anyway. That's, it's good. Well, and, and you know, I did already mention Kiss Me Deadly, but the next movie that Aldrich made was Kiss Me Deadly with, with, with Ralph Meeker as a very, uh, a very dark version of Mike Hammer. Well, there you go. <clears throat> and the other thing that occurred to me when you mentioned this, we're back to Cooper and Lancaster being from slightly different acting eras, and and you know, and Lancaster being yep. much bigger in the way yes. he performs. And I, I I think when they pair those kind of people up, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. The the sparks really really can fly. <clears throat> now um my my final one let's 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 do an italian western okay now i'm not going to do leone that would be just too easy uh, i want to do death rides a horse oh with lee van cleef lee van cleef <clears throat> one one thing that that happened in the wake of um good the bad and the ugly being such a big success and then the 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 previous two uh leone uh eastwood westerns is that Eastwood didn't really do a lot more westerns immediately. He did hang them high over here, but he didn't do any more Italian westerns. And so, the person who really benefited from uh, for a few dollars more and uh, and also Good, the Bad, and the Ugly was basically Lee Van Cleef because they the, there there was a bunch of of westerns that he had made over there both before and after that got released over here. Um, and Day of the Guns, I think, is one of them. But but the one that I really love is Death Rides a Horse. John Philip Law basically plays the the Eastwood type character, and uh, there's a father son mentor thing going on uh, between Lee Van Cleef and and John Philip Law. But what uh, 
John Philip Law doesn't know is that Lee Van Cleef was part of the gang that that killed his his parents. So we're we're headed toward a very dark place at the end of the movie, and how it resolves is you're going to have to look at the movie to to see. But it is a very stylish movie. The the director is, and again, th this always kind of it startles me when I go look at their uh, IMBD, and and he he only did a handful of westerns. This particular director. And you, you would think they would be specialists, but all of these these Italian filmmakers of that period, they did whatever, you know, whatever the next assignment was, they 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 did it, and they worked in all kinds of different different genres. His name his name was a, a I can't even pronounce it, Giolio Petroni, and the but the writer, Luciano Vincenzona, wrote the good, the bad, and the ugly wrote for a few dollars more and wrote duck you sucker all of them are leone movies mm -hmm. so this is this is in a weird way the lost leone movie if you've liked those leone movies find you know uh, uh this is probably the best of the big gun down is a good one also mm -hmm. yes but uh the big good down the big gun down is quite good but death rides a horse is is a banger as they say it just got re-released too uh, for people that are listening to this or watching this Kino Lorber just put it yeah. out again I think it's the second release it's had yeah it's it's a, it's an excellent example of uh you know the brutality again it's got you know Morricone music and it's uh, it's it's well worth it's well worth your time and it it shows and this is startling if we go back to the stuff you you did from the 50s today but 1957, you know, which is the gunfight at the OK Corral and Frankie Lane is singing, you know, a yeah. Blazing Saddles type theme song, right? Ten years later is Death Rides a Horse. The difference between, the, you know, these these genres, and I, I do think what, I, I don't think Hollywood ever quite recovered from what, what the Italian Westerns did to them. And yeah. then the Italian Westerns ultimately were a kind of a fad really because they they hit the theaters i i saw that death rides a horse in the theater i saw the big gun down in the theater these got big releases in the wake of good the bad and the ugly which was an enormous hit and and so uh van cleef benefited from that and then van cleef was brought back to the united states and he did you know did one of the uh, magnificent seven sequels Mm -hmm. And was it, you know, he, in, in a number of movies that were done over here. Uh, and I got to meet him. I you met Lee Van Cleef? Yeah, I, I there was a, uh, a golf, like a celebrity golf tournament in the Quad Cities, which is near my home, uh, the Iowa, Illinois Quad Cities. And he was one of the guests. And I was determined to meet him because my character, Nolan, in my my Nolan book series is blatantly uh, based on the Lee Van Cleef persona from the from the Italian westerns. Even in the cover art of those, uh, yeah, uh, they go a little too far with that. <laughs> to tell you the truth, that I said kind of like Lee Van Cleef. Not let's not just do his face, but I, uh, you know, they're not going to sue me, so I don't care. Uh, <clears throat> but I got to meet him, and it was. I have to tell you, I've met a lot of celebrities. He was the only one. He he and uh, Paul Newman were the only two that intimidated me. I was frightened by him. I mean, he was so Lee Van Cleef. Well, is this because of his movies, or is this because of what he was projecting when you met him? Both. Okay. I was a huge fan. Fan, and I, I had patterned my my first series character after him physically, and and kind of his his persona. And uh, what happened in the interview, and I don't know if you've ever had this situation in an interview, I knew too much about him. And so I was, I was, some part of my brain was showing off with what I knew about him and not letting him tell his story. So it was not a good interview on my, ultimately it was because I got a lot of good stuff out of him. And eventually he warmed to me uh, because he knew, he, he, he warmed to me because he could tell just how much I, I admired yeah. him. But early on, he thought I was a jackass. I know he did, and uh, and you know, and my wife afterwards, who was with, had been with me, she said, "Well, that was uncomfortable." <laughs> and, and 
and, and, and but I did. I it was uh, the interview was published in uh, a couple of places. It was published in uh, Asian Cult Cinema, and I think there's a book that it was it collected in. So I did get to interview him and get to talk to him and talk to him about his Hollywood stuff. The you know High Noon, which he was in. We mentioned High mm-hmm. Noon a number of times, and he did a lot of film noir, and uh, was a, a terrific guy. And he was very nice to me ultimately. Uh, and, but but I, I I was I was you know uh, I was a, a fanboy. Once in a while, once in a while I just go there. I can't help it. It's, we are fans first and foremost, right? Yeah, we are. That's I a remain. wonderful story. And, and I got to meet him. I got to yeah. meet him. And and that 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 was important. And his 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 wife liked me a lot. And I sent her my my books and. Uh, yeah, and she said nice things to me in 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 a, in a few uh, missives that she sent my way. He really liked you. Lee really liked you. <laughs> wow, that's something. Yeah, Lee Van Cleef really liked you. Not at first. <laughs> <laughs> he grew on first. it, and I didn't like me very well at first either. I think at some point we should do a video just about spaghetti westerns, just about Italian and European westerns. Because I have a lot to say about them, the form, the 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 formula, the pattern that they follow, yeah, um, the operatic style, how they often choose visuals over narrative. But, but that's so you're true the writer. a lot of Italian of of Italian genre stuff. I find that I find that in Jalo too. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, like really really troubling because they're they're plot driven and then they don't care. Suddenly they don't care about the plot. Yeah. Yep. You're not supposed to ask too many questions. You're not supposed to pay too close of attention. You just kind of let it wash over you, which is getting harder for me the older I get. I'm like, that's that's not why I come to movies. All right, how was your last premiere? You've done another premiere for we we did we did four premieres of uh, in, in in Iowa of Blue Christmas, and uh, we are getting ready. I think today we're going to record a commentary for the Blu-ray. And it, it will not be out until uh, the Blu ray will not be out probably till October or November of this year. Yeah. And we're going to have a limited theatrical release, mostly in Iowa, uh, and where we've had a lot of support. We had a lot of support from the Fridley chain. We had a lot of support from uh, Beck and Woods, the, the, the team that brought you a quiet place who are from this part of the world. Uh, and they have a, a incredible theater called The Last Picture House. And we had a wonderful premiere premiere there. I did four premieres. I guess mm-hmm. you're really supposed to just do one, but I did four. Uh, and uh, I'm, it's 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 a small movie, but I'm very proud of it. And I think we did it. And and you know we have a on on our Blu-ray cover, we have a blurb from a very prominent critic. Yeah, his name is Heath Holland. Oh really? Yes. <laughs> Is that gonna make the cover for real? Yeah. Well, back cover. Okay. <laughs> you're yeah. The, you're, you're on the back. Back cover. cover at the very bottom is this no, fine print. Top. You're up at the top. You're telling. Oh, them what I like to that. Think. You're telling them what to think, which is what That's... a good critic. Yeah. Wants to do. I like that. So yeah, uh, and uh, I'm going to be writing uh, the last Mike Cameron novel this year from a uh, Mickey Spillane. Uh, fragment that I have, and I'm going to be doing the last Nathan Heller novel as well. So this is I'm wrapping some things up. Yeah, a big, I would say the the big thing that is that, that is going on right now is uh, our mutual friend uh, Robert Meyer Burnett is uh, and his uh, imagination connoisseurs. We're doing a and what he calls an he doesn't want to call it a podcast. He's calling it an immersive audio drama, but we're doing going to adapt the first Nathan Heller novel, and I'm going to do this scripting myself, full cast, uh, with uh, you know with, with with some name talent in there, and we're we're going to do tr- my novel True Detective, although we're not calling it True Detective because HBO beat me to it. It's yeah. called True Noir. People would think that you were writing the coattails of HBO, yeah, which is crazy. So- but it, it's called true noir and uh we're, we're going to be recording that very soon uh, there's a crowdfunding campaign that's a that's part of it that is it's funded already 
but we're, we want to be able to expand it into some physical media. And that's how we're going to, because I, I, physical media ain't dead in my house. I can tell you that. No, nor in the houses of anybody checking this episode out right now. That's right. Max, thank you so much for being here to talk about Westerns. We should absolutely do more Western coverage in the future because it's a genre that I think needs, needs more love now than ever before. Did you know that I wrote six Westerns? I did, but you should tell people. Well, yeah, I did a series uh, about a character called Caleb York that was created by Mickey Spillane in a, a screenplay he wrote for John Wayne that never was made. And uh, we, we turned it into a, a six book series. And of course, I've written a book about Wyatt Earp called Black Hats. And I did the novelization of the Maverick movie because I wasn't going to let anybody else write a Maverick novel but me. And you told me that you worked in the lyrics to the theme song throughout yeah. the course of the book. Yeah, you can. Yeah, the, the the whole theme song is in the book. One one phrase at a time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. Big Maverick fan. Big James Garner fan. Yes. And I'll put links as many links as I can fit in the description of this episode, so you can go find all of these all these books and check them out. Uh, Max, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so. It's much. It's always fun to talk to you, Heath. Thank you so much.